How's it going everybody? Ed Ricker here. I received a couple important emails regarding some new changes that the FAA is proposing and uh, they're actually seeking our feedback, uh, people who live in the United States of America who fly drones. So the first thing that we're talking about here, and by the way, the Node campaign is how I first found out about these uh, important FAA documents. I also received some of this information from Academy of Model Aeronautics, of which I'm a member. So there are two documents here, the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, NPRM, and the Advanced Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, ANPRM. Um, the first one is concerning flying small drones over people and at night. The second one includes possible restrictions on safe and secure drone operation, including standoff distances from drone operations, performing limits on drones, payload restrictions, and that type of thing. And these rules will, according to the No campaign, have a major impact on commercial drone pilots. Some of those impacts may be positive, some may be negative. We can go through a couple of them now. Now, the whole idea here is that the deadline for submission for comments from the public is April 15th, this Monday. So you have all weekend to read some of these documents, formulate your opinions, and click send on your comment. And I'm gonna to link to both of these documents in this video description so you can kind of read them yourself, kind of digest them, and then formulate your own opinions and comment. Uh, as of right now, there are actually a lot more people commenting on the second one, ANPRM, uh, not so many on the first one, although that it number is climbing. Uh, people have been trying to raise awareness, Node Campaign, DJI themselves, um, that I've seen people like 51 Drones on YouTube and a couple other people who've really been pushing this effort. And so that number has gone up for the NPRM. So let's go to the first one, NPRM. That is uh, the FAA-2018-1087. Summary, the FAA proposes to amend its rules applicable to the operation of small unmanned aircraft systems. This rulemaking would allow operations for small unmanned aircraft over people in certain situations and operations of UAS, small UAS, at night without obtaining a waiver. Those two things are pretty big deals uh, if, if you have any knowledge about Part 107 waivers and what's allowed and what's not allowed for commercial flying and that type of thing. Now those are the biggest items in this particular uh, document. You can see on the right, the scroll bar is about the size of a grain of rice, but you don't have to scroll through the entire thing. Basically, you can start with the executive summary and go down to number one, night operations. So it gives you a little bit of a, an overlay about what you can do right now, which means that you cannot fly UAS operations at night uh, unless you have a waiver. And they said that as of uh, late 2017, the agency received almost 5,000 requests and uh, granted only a little over 1,000 of them. The vast majority of those were disapproved because the waiver requests lacked necessary information. So after over a year of sitting on that information, uh, apparently they considered the most critical factors to ensuring safety during night operation to be anti-collision lighting, and operator knowledge. Now we've always had to use anti-collision lighting if we're flying between, you know, either half an hour before sunset or half an hour after, that civil twilight zone of time. Uh, and then also, that also uh, applies to sunrise. This would allow us to potentially, if this passes and everything, fly at night with those anti-collision lights all night. As long as you also demonstrate that you had the proper operator knowledge, for flying at night. So there might be an increased um, or like an additional test taking component for part 107 uh, certificate holders. Uh, I don't know if it's gonna be something that you have to take in addition or if you just have to pass that when you renew the test every two years, who knows. Now with those small anti-collision lights, for a while, I didn't even know what lights would actually work with that. But there is a company, I'm gonna to link to them. Their name is gonna be right here in the video. Um, and they have these little cube lights that you can attach to both ends of either your Mavic or your Phantom or your Inspire. And they are indeed anti-collision lights uh, at night. So that's what you could use most likely uh, for this operation. Second, operation over people. Now this was an interesting one. I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. Operating over people, well, they break this into three categories. Category one is small UAS below 0.55 pounds. So these are drones you don't even have to register. The FAA says that they pose a low risk of injury, so those can be flown 
pretty much all over, you know, above people. Category two is where things get interesting though, when a drone weighs more than 0.55 pounds. However, it calls for a pretty major redesign of some drones. It's not likely that a lot of our drones that we fly now, according to some of these specifications, um, we could fly those over people without some serious modification or some serious uh, safety uh, additions. So, I mean, you've got different like parachute companies for drones where there's like a little parachute mount that comes off of it. I saw Billy Kyle do a video on one of those, check that out. Um, so that may be one of those things that we will have to require or have to, it has to be required of us to have on the drone to fly over people. Uh, it could also be uh, maybe props that don't lacerate. So they're like a prop redesign, or maybe props that are like internally within the drone that don't actually pose a hazard to, you know, flesh and whatever. Uh, maybe they're like inside of a cage. I don't know. There's gonna have to be some research and development for these drone companies to make a drone that would actually uh, fit some of these specifications. So in addition to not lacerating or posing any injury like that, it also can't, uh, let's see what it says, not result in an injury as severe as the injury that would result with a transfer of 11 foot pounds of kinetic energy from a rigid object. Category three has a higher threshold of injury, 25 foot pounds of kinetic energy from a rigid object. Um, but then there are also some stipulations like you can't hover over a person. You can only be traveling over a person. So category three is for those heavier drones or the faster drones or the drones with a heavier payload perhaps. Um, but it's, it'd be tedious to fit all this criteria. So it'd be interesting to see what drone companies would do in order to uh, actually get a, a drone that is going to be authorized to fly over people f by the FAA. In DJI's prepared response to the NPRM, they suggest adding a category for reliable drones or drones that are less likely to fail and fall out of the sky, causing human impact. For example, a drone that has an established level of reliability based on a manufacturer's own quality assurance testing. DJI suggests that those might be permitted to fly over people briefly. Now let's read some of the comments of people who have actually already uh, spoken up here. He says, uh, this is uh, Stuart Dunaway. I disagree with the proposed rule for flying over people. First is the lack of enforcement. Imagine the rule is passed and I launch my drone straight up to 100 feet. Then I proceed in a flight direction when someone looks up and sees the drone. How many people can determine it went directly over their head? So you can imagine some people who say, that flew right over me, when in fact you didn't. You flew like five feet to one side of them, it almost looked like they were directly over you, but you weren't because you were so high. It'd be hard to tell exactly how close you were to someone's little personal bubble here. Now, I don't really think that changes anything about our current policy or this proposed policy, but it is uh, kind of one of those gray areas, those loopholes there with the, the, with the FAA regulations. Um, then another person, this is Kevin Adelsberger. Uh, I am a part 107 licensed drone operator, want to strongly protest the proposed rule about flying over a move, moving vehicle. So there is uh, a, a line here saying that you can't fly over moving vehicles or a, 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 flying over a person who is in a moving vehicle. Now he and Russ of 51 Drones both have a point about flying over uh, a moving vehicle with a person in it. If you're flying over a vehicle and then your drone drops out of the sky, but that, that vehicle's moving, by the time the drone actually falls, the, the vehicle's gonna be gone. So if they really wanted us to not fly over vehicles, you, you, you'd almost not, you'd almost wanna say, well, don't fly over highways, where there's a constant stream of vehicles or something like that. Because just flying over a moving vehicle, you could violate that without putting that moving vehicle in any harm or you know any uh, dangerous situation. Gerard Exubery, I'm hoping I'm saying these names right, uh, says flight over people will be useful in expanding beneficial and in some cases life-saving operations across industries. He supports the FAA creation of category one, which allows any drone below 0.55 pounds to be operated over people without special modifications or testing, but he says that that limit is too low. Uh, that was a number chosen in 2015 to quickly implement drone registration rather than to set the future limits of operational limits. Gerard also points out the flaky reasoning of the moving vehicle uh, policy. Now let's go on to the advance notice of proposed rulemaking. Um, so this is FAA-2018-1010. 
1086-001. The FAA is considering additional rulemaking in response to public safety and national security concerns associated with the ongoing integration of UAS in the national airspace system. The FAA is seeking information from the public in response to the questions contained in this ANP. RM. So this document is designed, put out, like, like uploaded and shown for us for the sole purpose of, of asking for feedback. So they are asking for us to answer questions that they are posing in this document and, and listen to our comments. So that's pretty awesome that they're giving us this opportunity. Now, this is the one that the AMA had some issues with. Um, and some of the reasons for that is we go down to some of the, uh, the language in here. So they started quoting in this document some things about not flying, well actually they, they quoted the United Kingdom's policy about uh, operating at least 150 feet away from people and property and 500 feet away from large crowds and built up areas unless given special permission. So people and property. Um, I don't know how you're going to be able to fly some of these drones and stuff in parks when that seems to be the case people and property, you gotta stay 150 feet away from them. They also quote some of the rules from Canada, which proved to be a nightmare for some of the drone operators in Canada. Do not take after Canada, please, FAA. That would be a horrible, horrible thing for us. DJI, in their response to ANPRM, has suggested that if standoffs are nonetheless implemented, they should be narrowly defined and limited to people and property as to which drone flight would pose a serious security or safety risk and not just a blanket limitation. They also provide some rationale for why they don't support the introduction of new altitude, airspace, and other limitations in Part 107. They also give some insight into why unmanned traffic management is not well suited to addressing public safety and security needs, and why system design requirements are a bad idea that would slow the innovation process and pose a substantial cost on those making and using drone equipment. For both documents, DJI has a well thought out response that you might be able to pull some ideas from in your own comments. If we continue to comment on these documents and we really share our thoughts and concerns, then they're probably going to continue to probe us back when they want to do a policy change because uh, they know that we actually care and there's so many of us who are willing to put forth the effort and time to uh, make sure that our voice is heard. To quote DJI Public Policy Manager David Hansel, the FAA is asking many good questions about how to best ensure that drones remain a safe addition to the airspace as they are allowed to perform more types of complex operations. Professional drone operators could seize this opportunity to say to have a say in the rules that will govern how and whether they can use expanded capabilities to achieve great things with drones. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. We'll, we'll uh, connect again. And until next time, happy flying.